Good evening. Welcome to our prayer meeting Bible study for March 17th, 2021. It's been quite a year, and the last few weeks, I don't know about you, but sometimes Isaiah gets a little old to have judgment, judgment, judgment every week, and I'm I haven't really known how to encourage us with that, so we're going to talk about judgment again. <laughs> um, but I'm going to do so out of Psalm 97, which actually hopefully will help us to think through how to respond to God's judgment, you know, how to rejoice in God's judgment and why. So Psalm 97, we'll pray first. And we'll read it, and then we will think our way through uh, the delighting in God's judgments. So let's pray. Father, we come understanding that we deserve judgment, and by your grace, you forgive, you restore, you save us forever. Thank you for that privilege, that gift you give us. But then, Lord, we see you promising judgment on sin. You see, we see you carrying out judgment on sin. And sometimes that gets a little old for us, and I pray that even this evening you would encourage us, even with Psalm 97, that you are still good and that we can rejoice in it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's read Psalm 97, then we'll work our way through it. It starts out saying, The Lord reigneth, let the earth rejoice, let the multitude of islands be glad thereof. Clouds and darkness are round about him, righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. A fire goeth up before him, and burneth up his enemies round about. His lightnings enlightened the world, the earth saw and trembled, the hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord. At the presence of the Lord of the whole earth, the heavens declare his righteousness. All the people see his glory. Confounded are all they that serve graven images, that boast themselves of idols. Worship him, all you gods. Zion heard and was glad, and the daughters of Judah rejoiced because of thy judgments, O Lord. For thou, Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. You that love the Lord hate evil. He preserves the souls of his saints. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. So we have 12 verses, and we have to try to understand what is going on here. Notice verse 1 is really the statement of the theme, the Lord reigns, so let the earth rejoice. Verse 12, the end of the psalm, is really a restatement of that. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. A restatement of this call to rejoicing. And then in between, we work in and, and muddle around in the things to rejoice over a little. Now, verses 2 through 6, or we might even say 1 through 6, uh, answer this question, who is God? What is he like? What does he do? Verse 6b, right in the middle of the psalm, makes an observation. All the people see his glory. Uh, let's face it, people who are being judged and people who see others being judged, people who receive God's blessing, Everybody sees God's glory, but people respond differently to it. And that's where the next few verses go, 7, 8, and 9, talk about the reactions of two different groups of people when they see what God is like. One reacts with shame or being confounded, and the other reacts with joy. Verses 10 and 11 then describe how we should respond people that love the Lord, in light of these truths. And then verse 12 again returns to that restatement of the theme, rejoice in the Lord. Psalm 97 is where we're at. 
And how I got here was thinking about Isaiah, all the judgments of God, um, considering what we did Sunday morning in the bulletin insert about Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, and God's promises of, if you do this, I will respond by doing that. And how do I respond with God's judgment? either to me or, you know, that was a very idiotic thing I just did, and I reaped the consequences, or when I see somebody else in judgment, or I see the promises of God towards judgment. How do I respond with that? And, and as I'm reading and studying, I came on this psalm, and I believe it helps us to think our way through it. So the first, I'm going to just kind of consolidate the points to three, verses one through six a, who is God, what is he like, what does he do? Um, then the reaction of the people when they see his glory, the end of verse six, on through verse nine, shame or joy, and then the third um, section, how should we then live? We should live by hating evil and rejoicing in the Lord. So let's start out with the first six verses. You know, who is God, what does he do, what is he like? And the first verse there, the Lord reigns, so let the earth rejoice, let the multitude of violence be glad. Who is God? What does he do? Well, he's in charge. He reigns. God rules. God reigns. Um, just so you know, I, I want to encourage you with the next few weeks of Isaiah. It's actually encouraging the next two weeks because we see God reigning in glory in eternity both the chapter 11 of Isaiah and chapter 12, comes to this conclusion and calls us to rejoice in it. The Lord reigns, so rejoice. He reigns over everybody. He reigns over those who trust him, and he reigns over those who don't trust him. The Lord reigns. Well, what else? Verse 2, clouds and darkness are round about him. Uh, does that sound helpful or does that sound harmful? Does that sound scary or does that sound like something you would rejoice in? This isn't a new picture. If you think back of Mount Sinai and Moses went up on the mountain to get the law and there's this cloud and everything hanging over them. Well, the cloud actually started before, didn't it? Remember them leaving Egypt and there's a pillar, pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. Um, describing God's presence. Uh, there's several different ways that people see that we may interpret that cloud and the darkness. One thing that's sure is that God, we never really get to understand him clearly. Call it incomprehensible or something like that. Does that mean we shouldn't try? Does that mean we shouldn't say be Moses and go up on the mountain? Does that mean we shouldn't be the people down in the valley? Um, understanding God's laws and listening to Moses' instructions? No, we should listen. We shouldn't be discouraged. God has given us everything that we, he wants us to know about himself. But there is a darkness there. There is, he's way beyond our understanding. And it's all glorious, and that's the amazing thing. But, but there's clouds and darkness. What else? In verse 2, there's righteousness and justice. And notice it says it's the habitation of his throne. It's several ways you might think of that. It's his throne, the foundation that his throne sits on is righteousness and justice. Uh, some leaders, world leaders, um, Betsy and I are reading a book right now on, on bombers in World War II. That sounds like a, a depressing book to read, doesn't it? But um, it, it's a lot of fun stories, that you, human interest stories relating to, okay, so this person on the plane came from here, and this person on the plane came from here. Now we're in Serignola, Italy, and we're meeting the Italians, and and the townspeople, and all of that. But woven into it is the horror 
of, of leaders that are ungodly, that are wicked. And, and, and they lead, they judge, their throne is founded on terror, or it's founded on manipulation, or founded on just plain power and threats. But what is God's throne founded on? Righteousness and justice, judgment. You know, proper ruling as opposed to um, just power struggles. He isn't just exercising his authority over us. He is righteous and he's just. Now, we're often afraid of tyrants because we don't know what they're going to do. God, we don't understand fully, but we're not afraid of him because we know that everything he does is founded on what is right and just. So that helps us to even think about God's judgments and to rejoice in them because he's going to do the right thing as opposed to doing the wrong thing. Well, what else do we see? Verses 3 and 4 are kind of together. A fire goes up before him. It burns up his enemies round about. Um, this sounds like some kind of movie we'd watch, doesn't it? Where it just torches his enemies. Uh, well, what else? Verse 4, his lightnings brightened or enlightened the whole world. You can just picture in the middle of the night a thunderstorm coming through and, and, and the lightning just lights up everything. And some have considered that maybe these are the same fire, that the fire in verse 3 is the lightning that came down and just consumed um, the wicked. It's possible, or it could be two different fires. But how does the earth respond when it sees this? The earth trembles. The earth itself. Um, God is a consuming fire. Uh, that is an interesting uh, thing to chase through your concordance. It, it's this whole idea of, of fire consuming God's enemies. And, and that is all through Scripture. We, we'll get to a couple places in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 30, Isaiah chapter 33, to speak of God in this way, where God and his fire and his lightning consume his enemies. But they don't consume, notice that in, in verse 3, it doesn't consume his people. It only consumes his enemies. So we can be encouraged by that. The end of verse 4 the earth saw and trembled, the hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord. He, he's the Lord of the whole earth. And then the heavens declare his righteousness. Um, here's the creation. God is Lord. God reigns over all creation. And creation itself is trembling. Creation itself is responding to what it sees. Kind of interesting in verse 5, the hills melted like wax. Um, today I, I was looking out the front window and the suet feeder was empty. He says, Oh, those poor birdies, they're not there. Anything to so, so I said, Well, I, I just cooked some bacon the other day and I have the grease out back and and we have the the cheap, cheap, cheap um, cashews that came from the salvage place at 50 cents a pound and so so I made cakes of, of fat with nuts in it and it doesn't take much to melt baking grease what does it take to melt the earth what does it take to melt granite all it takes is a word from God it takes God's fire and God um, the, earth, the hills are melting at his presence. They're, they're, they're shaking in their boots, you might say. And then the heavens are declaring his righteousness. Even the, the skies and the stars are saying, God reigns in a righteous way. And they're, and they're yelling it out for everybody to see and to hear. So who is God? He's the righteous, just creator. He's the ruler of heaven and earth. He's the consuming fire. He is the moral authority of the universe. 
he will make sure that every single sin that ever happens in this world is judged and punished. And we know that he will either do that by allowing us to trust in Jesus' payment he already made, or by judging them himself because they refuse that payment. So that is God, the just ruling creator of all the heaven and earth. Then we come to 6b, all the people see is glory. Here is the reaction in verses 6b through 9. The reaction of the people is either shame or joy. All the people see. You think about that. that. That person you work with that rejects Christ, that very vocally and loudly and obnoxiously says, I'm not going to have anything to do with him. They see his glory. All people see his glory. But people respond in two different ways. They respond either by being confounded or shamed in verse 7. What kind of people are these? They're the people that serve something other than God. Graven images. They boast themselves in their idols. And then notice the end of verse 7. Worship him, all you small g gods. Now, all of the idols, all the other things that we might worship, they always take second place. They always serve God's purposes. God reigns. That's how the psalm started. God is in charge. So just like in Isaiah, these people in verse 7 have trusted something other than God. They've said, oh man, I'm afraid. Um, the nation above us, northern kingdom of Israel, they're going to attack us. And Syria, they've joined together with Israel. And, and the two of them together, we're, we're sunk. So we've got to make some kind of agreement here to protect ourselves. So we will make an agreement with Assyria. Well, we just bowed to a smaller God than God, a small G God, who will bow to the Creator God one day. Well, what's going to happen? They're going to be confounded. They're going to be shamed. They're, they're going to be confused. They're going to be upside down. So we often trust other things, and when we do, we are put to shame. That's part of God's goodness to show us that it is a dead end to trust in those kinds of things. And, and it, once again, we can either dig our heels in with our rejection of God because of the shame, or we can turn to God and trust him more fully. And, and that is really the, the point of a song like this that the Israelites were to sing is to say, I don't want to be this person. I want to be the person in verse 8 who heard and was glad. Remember, Zion is, is a picture, a, a, a word picture, a, a word that stands in place of Jerusalem and God's people in a broader sense. So God's people heard, you might say, in verse 8, and they were glad. The daughters of Judah rejoiced because of your judgments, O oh God. Why are they rejoicing? Because of God's judgments. Now, I, I just clarify this a little bit. This isn't just his punishment. It's a broader word speaking of all of his, his ruling, what is involved in ruling. And maybe one of the ways that we could picture this is in, in America, we have three branches of government the legislative that makes the laws, the executive that carries out the laws, and the justice department, the judicial branch, that then puts penalties on those who, who don't follow the laws. And this judgment, this justice of God, would, would involve all of these. It's the broader ruling type of judgments here in verse um, yeah, in verse 8. So God is making perfect rules for us to follow. They are good rules. They always are for our benefit and for his glory. He puts those rules into effect. He helps us to carry them out if we will just trust him. 
but then he maintains order, and one day, all of the books will be settled. He, he will make sure that everything is paid for. All disobedience, all sin will be paid for. And it will either be, they trusted Christ, their name is in the Lamb's Book of Life, paid in full, or judgment eternal. And then there's temporal judgment as well that we see to remind us that eternal judgment is coming. So why are we glad in verse 8? Well, because God is ruling perfectly. He's doing his job, and he's doing it appropriately. So we recognize God's position. We recognize God's exalted rule over us and over the world, and then we rejoice in that rule. So how should we live, verses 10 through 12? How should we respond to that? Well, verse 10, you that love the Lord hate evil. So that would be the first thing that we see. Well, why don't we hate evil? Why do we tolerate it? Why do we make excuses for evil in our own lives or possibly somebody else? We say, well, they had a bad upbringing. Well, they've had a hard day. Uh, we sometimes excuse it. There's probably two primary reasons where we may um, hate, we, we may kind of accept evil and not hate it. The first is we see that others are evil or exercising evil. And we're afraid that if we don't join them, that they may get some kind of advantage over us. Um, if I don't join them in evil, I'll, they might beat up on me. They may take advantage of me. They may get my stuff. So again, like Judah and Isaiah making agreements with Assyria, they put up with evil, wicked Assyria because they're afraid of somebody else's evil. Sometimes we do this. But notice the end of verse 10, how it answers this objection. He preserves the souls of his saints. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. You don't have to join the wicked to be saved. Trust yourself into God's hands. Run to him. Once again, like Isaiah, we've seen over and over, the safest place to be is to run to a just God, to run to a God who punishes sin. Accept his forgiveness. Accept his forgiveness protection. Jehovah saves, as Isaiah says. Well, another reason, again, we have a fear that others may take advantage of us. Another reason for not hating evil is we fear we may miss out on something in life, something that may be good. Um, there's just so much about life where we hear rules and we think, what a horrible parent I have that is keeping me from enjoying the things that my friends are enjoying. But then sometimes we think the same thing about God. God gives us all of these do not do this, and we think he may be keeping us from something actually joyous. You see, we often like the evil. And we're afraid we may miss out on it. We enjoy the evil more than God. And verse 11 answers this. Light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. What is the most happy place to be where God wants you to be? In his presence. He will give us more joy than any sin could ever give us. In your presence is joy forevermore, another psalm says. And we would do well to listen to a psalm like this and actually absorb it and to say we respond to watching God's judgment, the first part of the psalm, by rejoicing in God and then running to him, hating evil. And understand that God sows light for the righteous. Light, again, being direction, but light also being this blessing of God and this joy 
Um, you talk about somebody ha having a dark um, emotional day. Well, you, you, you aren't saying that they were really joyful today. You, you are saying the opposite of that. Well, light, it brings joy, and God gives light to the righteous, and he gives gladness to the upright in heart. So how do we respond? We respond by hating evil, by loving the good, by running to God's presence. And then, once again, verse 12 confirms that by saying rejoice in all of the Lord's gifts. No, it's rejoice in the Lord. You righteous give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. So the praise, um, rejoice or praise here, um, praise his holy name, or give thanks to his holy name. Uh, it's never used of us speaking to a person in the Bible. That's kind of interesting. It's only speaking, it's only used to speak of us giving praise or thanks to God. It carries really a lot of a bushel basket full of weight, you might say, of understanding who God is and then responding appropriately to who God is. And appropriately means that, yes, we shake in our boots relating to his judgments, relating to his punishment of sin, but then we thank him, we praise him, we jump up and down in rejoicing because he's already forgiven our sin and we know he will take care of any of the wicked people who are abusing us today. So rejoice in him, recognize who he is, what he's done, because God reigns the way the psalm starts. So a few questions for me and you. How do I react to God's judgment? Do I tend to uh, shy away from passages that speak of God punishing evildoers? Or do I rejoice in that? Do I rejoice and say, God punishes all sin, and then rejoice? Because he's already punished all sin in Jesus, if I will just trust in him. Do I rejoice that God is absolutely righteous, unlike any other leader we have ever seen in our life or ever will see? We will never see anybody like him. He's always righteous, always good. He's the ruler. He's the moral authority. He will return in the future to establish perfect justice to punish all evil. For his people, those who trust him, he comes as the bridegroom to take us away with him for all eternity, you might say. For the wicked, for the people who reject him, judgment forever. So jettison your idols, you might say. Rejoice in God himself. Delight in his rule of the world. The Lord reigns. So we rejoice. Let the earth rejoice. And that's where we'll wind it up this evening.